Brother Jesse is going to come and give us a charge to the ministers, basically just uh, the burden on his heart concerning ordaining new ministers to the administrating offices of the church. Um, we're not ordaining these men to preach. They've already been doing that. We're not ordaining them to be disciples. They should already be that. We're not ordaining them to be ambassadors for Christ. Every disciple of Christ, every Christian should be that. Ordination has to do with administrative authority in the body of Christ, in the church of Jesus Christ. And so that's a great responsibility. It has to do with where this church is going to be in 20 years. And so, Brother Jesse, you come ahead and share what the Lord has laid on your heart. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of you. Um, there will be benefit to you to listen in because a lot of this is just general, general uh, understanding that the people of God should have. Um, it's going to have some background as far as why, why we would be doing what we're doing this morning. Um, and uh, there's a number of different references we're going to be looking at. You can follow along if you want to. Um, otherwise, just listen in. We're going to be starting in Acts chapter 7, starting at verse 30. Um, it's talking about Moses here. He had his Egypt days and thought that he would deliver the people of God and the timing wasn't right, the method wasn't right, and he had to flee for his life. He spent 40 years out in the wilderness taking care of sheep. And we pick up in, chap in verse 30 of Acts 7. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord said unto, came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord, to him, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, which, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Several observations here. A very significant one is, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. We're going to be looking at some early church history this morning, all right? We're maybe not used to thinking of the children of Israel in the wilderness as being a church in the wilderness. But it was a called out assembly of God's people. He had brought them out of Egypt, and they were very much a church in the wilderness. We see that God appointed Moses to be a ruler and a deliverer. <clears throat> Now, the children of Israel were eager for a deliverer, but in process of time, they proved that they weren't so much interested in a, somebody to tell them what to do, as a general rule. Now, there's lots of people that like that as well. They like the thought of being delivered from the consequences of sin, 
but they don't like anybody being able to instruct them or tell them what to do. Well, God has both in mind. If he's going to deliver you, he's going to also instruct you. Amen. And he works, he works a lot of times through people to do that. Um, there was a time when Amalek came and, and fought against Israel as they were there in the wilderness and took some of them prisoner. <coughs> now imagine if they would have been out there all by themselves, those few people. There would have been no deliverer. But at a time like that, they were very grateful to have a Moses say, you know what, fellas? And you get together a crew and go, free our, free those people that we just lost. They needed somebody with authority there to set things in motion and bring about their release. The children of Israel were, were redeemed from Egypt. I think of that Passover night and the, the lamb that was killed and everything that took place there. They were redeemed. They went out joyful of heart, excited. But it says, makes mention here that in their hearts, they turned back again into Egypt. They got out there to Mount Sinai and Moses went up into the mountain and it was gone. And he was gone the next day too and the next and the next. And it's like, what has become of this Moses? And many times, several times in their days in the wilderness, their years in the wilderness, they manifest that Egypt was still very much in their hearts. And because of that, it ended up that they could could not enter Canaan. Because yes, they had been delivered from Egyptian bondage, but not from Egyptian values. And Jude, Jude verse five makes the statement I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye knew, once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. He saved them out of the land of Egypt. You know, you can be saved from sin, but that don't mean that you will arrive in heaven. There is a continuation that must take place. Right. God is going to use your days here on earth to try and get the Egyptian values or the, world, the carnal nature out of you. And if he can't do that, you won't enter in. Right. Also in 1 Peter, we have, I want to show you the great similarity between early church history in the wilderness and early church history in the apostles day and then the next logical step would be that we should be patterning after that in first peter chapter 1 starting in verse 13 it says but ye are a chosen generation no, that's in verse that chapter 2. We're in verse chapter 1 yet. 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy. For I am holy, and if you call on the Father, who without respect to persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot,
Here we have, don't fashion yourselves according to your former lusts and your ignorance. Uh, don't operate according to your carnal nature. That needs to be rooted out. Even as we saw that with the Israelites there in the wilderness, Egypt needed to get out of their hearts. <clears throat> we see that we are to be holy as he is holy. We are to use his definition of holy as what we use to define holy as well. Right. Pass the time of our sojourning here in fear. Because we're not home yet. We're not guaranteed to make it home unless we are carefully observing that which he has commanded us. We are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Very much that was foreshadowed in the Passover lamb there in Egypt. But here we have the, the fulfillment of that type. By the children of Israel, they started good. They were overthrown. Many of them were overthrown in the wilderness. In other words, the, the things they encountered caused them to lose confidence in the goodness of God. If we go to Exodus 18, the children of Israel are out in the wilderness, and in Starting in verse 13, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening, even? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me, me to inquire of God. When they ha have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another. And I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. <clears throat> and Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them, to be rulers of thousands, and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter that they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge, uh, it, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. <clears throat> so Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel, and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons, the hard causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. Here we have the choosing out of people to assist Moses in his job. Moses' job was to the propagation of godliness, the enforcement of the law that God was giving to them, and he it was quite a quite a load. And the advice here given to Seek out able men who would, would help him bear that burden. A very wise thing. This was a very important work. And when Jethro says, the thing that thou doest is not good, uh, he was not saying the work is not a good work, but your method or your, your way of doing it is not going to be a success. 
because it'll, you'll wear out. This was an important work. It should be shared by many. Able men. Notice what it says about them. Able men such as fear God. It's the very first thing on the list. Men of truth. The truth is the most important factor here. Hating covetousness. They're not looking to receive their reward in this life. They're not seeking their own advancement in this life. Place such over them. They were able to understand principles of judgment, grasp it, and then the people were able to come to them and have their cases heard in a very timely manner. And they were able to make judgments on most matters. However, if there was ever anything that was too hard for them, it was like, well, let's take this one to Moses. Notice that Moses, even though he had such a good relationship with God, he received so much instruction directly from God. It is through Jethro that this wisdom or this idea comes. You know, there's things in life that God wants you to know that he probably is not going to tell you except through somebody else. And if there's nobody else to tell you, to tell you through, you very well could just go through life missing it. That's an important part of the, the church body. Amen. Because ignorance does you no good. Ignorance has consequences. Mm -hmm. In the next chapter, in verse 3, Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thou sh Thus shalt thou say to the children of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bury you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will keep, obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. I thought they walked. It says here, he bare them on eagles' wings. It's, maybe that's a nice way of saying, you weren't alone. I, I enabled you to make this trip. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm in favor of this, and so I'm with you. I'm enabling you. We notice here a covenant, an agreement. They, they were to keep his commandments, and God was going to have them as a special people unto himself, a peculiar treasure, um, a very unique situation there. You notice he says the kingdom of priests and yet we would think, well, they had a certain select group of people who were the priests. They were part of the tribe of Levi. So why do you say a kingdom of priests? And perhaps it has to do with the fact that everyone was supposed to be in his service. Uh, there were various roles in his service, but everybody was supposed to be employed in the, the fulfillment <clears throat> of godliness for whatever role they were in. I think that was sharply different than many than the heathen heathen nations, their gods, in which you had the, the priests who were to, supposed to appease their god or were supposed to take care of that part, but the people could go on about their everyday life pretty well as they please and just occasionally maybe make some type of sacrifice. But here God wanted a whole nation of people who were diligent to do his will for their particular role. Well, if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6,
think we'll notice something very interesting. In 6.14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. Ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Come out from among them. O be a special people unto me. I will be their God, they shall be my people. There's a covenant there, an agreement. You do your part, I'll do my part, I'll receive you. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. These promises do, do not give any room for you to just sit back and take it easy. I mean, after all, God promised. Yes, he promised to do that if, if you did your part. If you're perfecting yourself from all uncleanness and such. In Acts chapter 15, thinking along the line of able men to aid in God's work. In Acts 15, a certain man which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, and Peter rose up, and he shared his experiences there. Here was a matter, a hard matter, not easily settled, it was essential to settle it because the church could not prosper with it unsettled. We notice the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. That was what they were supposed to do. And they discussed the situation thoroughly, listened to the different viewpoints and experiences and and then, in verse 19, James is talking. James was uh, the head of the church there. And he made this proposal. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. He mentions a few things that they need to be sure to do. This was talking about whether or not they needed to observe all the ceremonial law. He said these are the necessary things for them to observe. And then 22, then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, and chief, chief men among the brethren. And also like in 25 men, let's see. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. And we have, let's see, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. This is the way it's supposed to work. Right. It does not indicate that any of the leadership were in opposition to this decision, but rather it would all points in the direction that all the elders were... They saw what James proposed. They saw the wisdom of God in it. And considering the evidence and everything, 
It's like there's no other way to go. And so they were behind it. There was unified leadership there. And that should always be the case when there's something that's required of the flock. I think the leadership should always be totally in agreement on it. Um, and it, it's only reasonable because if proper people are ordained, I mean, fear God. You have to fear God. And not just in a small way, but in a major way. And people who fear God, when there's issues that are necessary issues, they should be able to discuss it and come to unanimous agreement. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Yeah, that was where I started reading the other time. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. <clears throat> Listen, see if you've heard this one before. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, wasn't that all said to the children of Israel there in the wilderness? Amen. Here we have the church in the apostles' day hearing the same message. Um, Show forth the praises of him. In other words, manifest the right ways of God in the midst of whatever generation you're living in. You do it God's way. He's called you out of darkness. He's called you out of Egyptian corruption and all that went on there. You were not a people, but now you are a people. Strangers and pilgrims, even as the children of Israel in the wilderness, the wilderness wasn't their home. They only belonged there as a means of being transferred to somewhere else. God's people today also are to be strangers and pilgrims. In other words, we're looking for a, a place, a future place. The things of this life are simply for this life. It's, we're passing through. The, the admonition to abstain. See. Abstain from fleshly lusts. If the children of Israel, the church in the wilderness had done that, there would have been a lot more going into Canaan. But too often the lusts were what dominated the situation. But there are fleshly lusts which war against us entering into heaven, dwelling with God for eternity. And those things we need to be constantly on guard for. Seek to root them out. And back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, look at something else. You know, the children of Israel encountered some very challenging situations there in, in the wilderness. It a lot of times brought a bitter response out of them. In Deuteronomy 8, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. That ye might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart 
that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, in a land of brooks, of water, fountains. And it goes on to talk about how good that land is. Um, that was what they were looking forward to. We have a, an eternal good to look forward to. But God wanted them to be able to live, to multiply, to possess. That was his dreams for them. All right? They encountered hardships. And that was not what was foremost in their mind. The, the foremost in their minds was not, oh, God is working to bring us into good. No, they would revert to complaining. Remember, remember what I brought you through. Seemingly impossible circumstances. Whether you were out of water, um, just the fact of bringing you through that desert land. Remember, remember. I was proving you, testing you to see what was in your heart. You should have been paying attention as well. Because... When we encounter hard times, watch what comes out. Watch what we're, you're prone to. It's an indication of what's in your heart. A lot of times in the, in the pleasant situations, it doesn't show itself. And so you maybe don't think it's not there. Man shall not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The things of this life, the material things of this life are not what give you life. As far as true life, it's the word of God. The chastening. The chastening, it's for a purpose. It's for good. It's so he can do you good. Bring you into a good land. But it's good to remember sometimes what God has done in the past, how he's provided, how he's chastened. And it's a good thing to remind the sheep of occasionally as well. We're just passing through this life, even as they were just passing through the wilderness. The wilderness was not the, the ultimate goal God had for them, but it was an important part of getting them to a, the ultimate. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we have the reminder, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all drink the same, did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of God, them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon the en whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Don't forget about these examples. Don't be ignorant of it. They were overthrown. In other words, their, their confidence um, waxed pretty thin. And you notice here that they were tempting Christ. Well, we notice that they were baptized. We notice that they all eat the same spiritual meat, drank the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. Um, how is it any different than being a partaker of Christ today? They were partakers. Christ was there. He was in their midst. They were partaking of him. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. They were overthrown in the wilderness. 
They didn't make it. They would have been able to. They should have been able to. But these things are written for our admonition. Um, you notice several situations here where it talks about what they did and the fact that many of them were killed. Um, I wonder what, how the others felt. Did they feel like, well, I didn't do too bad that time because I'm still living? And yet, there came a point there at Kadesh Barnea where they failed the test and God said, that was your last chance. But up to that point, they were still a part of the group. They were still moving forward. They were still... They thought they were standing, maybe. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. The example there about tempting Christ was they were compassing the land of Edom, I believe it was, and they had to go around it. It was like it was a long way, and they got weary of it, and they, the people spake against God and against Moses, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people to accuse God of bringing them out to, to kill them. That, that is awful. Um, that's not why God brought them out. Leaders have a responsibility. Uh, there was the example of in the land of Canaan when there was somebody found dead out in the field. It was like, hey, nobody knew who did it. Well, maybe one person did, but nobody really knew who it was. And yet that didn't free them from guilt. And the leaders, the elders of the cities had an obligation there to deal with appropriately with the situation and God told them exactly how to do that uh, but thinking about leaders have have an obligation when something's out of order it's like God has appointed you to take care of this but in numbers numbers 27 Moses Moses is about ready to die and the thing that impresses me about it is his great concern. Moses spake in Numbers 27, 15, unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. The Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. And then Eliezer is going to be with him as well, as far as you can, he can inquire of God through Eliezer. Uh, but at Joshua's word, which was, would have been come from Eliezer, and that would have come from God, they're going to go out, and they're going to come in. Uh, but Moses concerned that the people of God be not as sheep without his shepherd. Because there's danger. And sheep without a shepherd are very prone to suffer great damage. In 2 Peter, we have a very similar concern manifest by Peter. Second Peter... One twelve. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, so you know them and be established in the present truth. Yeah, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle, in this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Knowing this that shortly, I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease, after I die, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
That situation is specially mentioned here because it is so important for everything else. I mean, if, if that wasn't the case, if Jesus wasn't that, then a lot of things he taught and uh, would lose their significance. Put you in remembrance. After my disease, after I'm gone, I want you to have these things always in remembrance because these are essential for your well-being. This is essential for the cause. And this cause is not all about me. When I'm gone, you don't need to remember so much about me. You need to remember this that I taught, this that I showed you. Uh, but his concern for the church, and something that came to my mind is, what will you and I pass on? What is our big concern about what, what will our children or what will our friends receive from us that they will carry on? In Acts chapter 20, I'm having to move right along here because um, <clears throat> that's, that's what the time is doing as well. Acts 20, verse 17. Yeah, this is Paul. He's, he called for the elders from Ephesus. And he's... You notice they already had the elders there. They didn't look around. It's like, well, who would that be? No, they were, it was already known who they were. And so when the call came, they went. He, he talks about how he had spent his time with them. Uh, he talks about the bonds and afflictions abiding him, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Uh, I take, wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. There's going to be grievous wolves coming in. He has, hadn't held back anything that was profitable to them. Through fear of what they might do, say, no. It was what they needed. He gave it to them. Um... <coughs> Don't count my life dear unto myself. That was an important part of him being able to finish, finish well. He's not shunned to declare unto them all the counsel of God. Notice that the Holy Ghost had made them overseers. And we believe that that is also what is taking place here. This is according to the Holy Ghost. Right. And... That's something to remember in the years to come. It talks about feeding the church of God. Now, he has a preference in what you feed them. It isn't just, well, any old thing will do. No, there's, there's special feed there that will help make the flock what he wants it to be. He's purchased it with his own blood. Consider that. There was a huge price paid. And to watch and remember. In First Timothy, First Timothy three. First Timothy three eight. Likewise must the deacons be grave. Not double tongue, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith and the pure conscience. Let these also first be proved, and then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, and sl not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their own children and their ruling their children in their own houses well. For they have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. It talks about them being
grave, not double tongue, not giving too much wine, aware of the seriousness of their responsibility. Um, you get involved in wine or something like that, it alters your thinking, and you're no longer being serious about filling your role properly. It talks about a, a pure conscience. Think of that as a, a clear conscience, never, never alter, twisting the truth for the sake of what might feel better for me, or, um, but always with a clear conscience, teaching the Word of God, applying the Word of God. It talks about the significance of their wives, the good pattern there that it is expected, and you know the wife has a has had an important effect on why you are what you are today. Ruling well, oh, it's a challenge because households are made up of people who have free will, have um, yeah, emotions, have all kinds of things, and, and it, is a, it is a challenge to learn to have that all directed in the right way, um, but life has challenges. There's a good reward awaiting you after you've after you've filled the office of a deacon well, after you've served well. But not only that, but there's also it talks about a great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, this is not something that you're serving in alone. God is there with you, and he's enabling you, helping you move forward. It talks in 2 Timothy chapter 2 about um, 22, about fleeing youthful lusts and following after righteousness, faith, peace, charity, and peace with them that call on the Lord out of, out of a pure heart. This is what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be composed of people like this, and these are the ones you're supposed to be following after, um, pursuing the things that are important to God. Talks too about uh, being apt to teach here. One who's apt to teach and about patience. It's like, well, yeah, what grade is that? Teaching. Is that preschool or what is it? It's a challenge to have the patience needed, but it's it's an important part of it because you're you're working for a cause, and that cause wants to see people embracing the truth and doing right. But it it goes on down in chapter three to talk about this. You no, know, also in the last days, perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. In other words, these things are going to be practiced by people professing godliness. In other words, churches are going to permit this type of stuff. This is the environment or the atmosphere in which you're called to work. In other words, this is the day and age that we live in. These dangerous times, these perilous times, and these are the characteristics of even many religious people. And yet these are the things, these are things that need to get rooted out because if they're not rooted out, the possibility of those people making it into the kingdom of God. I don't know that there's a whole, whole lot of hope there. Because those are the lusts and such that will, that will cause you to be overthrown in the tests of life. And a little bit from Second Peter. Second Peter chapter three. But 
But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, for not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And I would say also, be diligent that those who you oversee would also be found that way. Right. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul. Also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. God's not indifferent in his delay. Why hasn't he come yet? He's not indifferent. He's patiently waiting in hopes that more come to repentance, that more walk in the truth, that more are ready when he does come. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and find life. This earth and all the things in it will someday be burned up. We look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein there is righteousness dwelling to the exclusion of anything else, only righteousness dwelling there. If we want to be there, be diligent that we may be found of him. In other words, in his estimation, it's not all about impressing my peers. It's his verdict. You can rest the scriptures to your own destruction. There's no profit in that. Beware lest ye also fall. It doesn't doubt that you're presently standing. The beware is that you might cease to stand. The safeguard against falling is to grow in grace. In other words, the word of God, the revelation of God, takes root in you and produces, transforms you. And also to grow in the knowledge, more understanding. So there's, you're being transformed by what you do know and you're receiving more understanding as you understand things that formerly you were hidden from you yet. But just a few final thoughts here. Things for Brother Philip and Brother Nathan to not do, right? Do not panic. Whatever happened didn't take God by surprise. If you've been doing what you're supposed to be doing, there is a way through. Do not despair. This is something God wants to have successful. So don't despair. Do not be impatient. Good things take time. However, also don't be too, too, uh, no, just, Don't procrastinate either when things need to be dealt with immediately. But keep in mind that good things take time. And do not neglect study. Do not neglect to study the Word of God. Do not neglect prayer. How are you supposed to properly uh, carry out God's will if you aren't in tune with Him? Do not forget that your example means something. Maybe more than you realize. 
Do not seek your reward in this life. Your expectation of a full reward is later. You start seeking it in this life and you're going to deviate off the right path. Do not forget who owns the sheep and the price paid. Do not forget your own family. And do not forget that the day of the Lord will come. So, I would encourage you, be strong and have a good, and have a good courage. Help take care of this flock. And hold forth the word of life to this generation. And I'm, I'm pleased. I'm pleased with this whole, this whole idea, the whole working out of it. I believe it's a good team to be on. And, you know, there's, there's reason why we have four Gospels. It's like, why didn't God put everything in one Gospel? But think about it. The four Gospels are slightly different. They have a little different perspective. And you put them all together and you get a, a more complete picture, perhaps. We're all different. Different, different upbringings, different life experiences. Um, isn't that going to cause problems? It doesn't need to. It can actually complement and make a better whole than just one or two by themselves could. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you.